Some cliches are largely true, not all, but some. One of those that is largely true is that the Reformation has its roots in a reading of St. Paul. But the difficulty is that when that is said, there is also a necessity to understand what St. Paul's message precisely was. And that is not widely appreciated today. Further, each of the reformers had his or her particular reading of different parts of St. Paul. And therefore, the relationship between the Reformation and St. Paul, although vibrant, is not clear. And my purpose in our discussion during the course of this Lent is to investigate what I take to be the ideas behind the Reformation that constituted its engine, that propelled it forward, and that, I will argue by the end, keep it going. But I believe that those ideas can only be appreciated when we see how they're anchored in the issues that St. Paul was coping with. It's very fortunate that the fountainhead of the Reformation is Martin Luther, because he made clearer than anyone else his reliance on St. Paul and was also very specific in regard to how he was using Paul. At the same time, he is an ideal case of how it is that taking an idea from an earlier context and placing it within a new situation transforms the situation, and also transforms the idea. So let's begin with why I made the title today, Luther and His Maiden Epistle. Not because he wrote an epistle, but because there was an epistle that Martin Luther said he married. In his introduction to the New Testament, he provides paragraph-long introductions to each of the 27 books of the New Testament. When he comes to one epistle of Paul, he says, this is my darling little epistle to which I have plighted my truth. I have married this epistle. And we'll see in his discussion today that this issue of the use of marriage as a metaphor is one that he takes with profound seriousness. So why Galatians? There are longer epistles, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. There are more polished epistles that he cites. But for its length, there is more of St. Paul's core thinking in Galatians than in any other work in the New Testament, and that's why Martin Luther begins there. The reason Paul has to write in such a concentrated fashion to the Galatians is that he's dealing with a crisis and is trying to shift the behavior of a particular community. The name Galatians tells us where the epistle was targeted, is to the central region of present-day Turkey. It's in Asia Minor. You may be interested to know that in Greek, the term Galatoi, Galatians, is the equivalent in Latin of Keltoi, Celts, because there were, in fact, Celtic peoples who had been displaced as a result of imperial rule from Europe into present-day Turkey. So, as you might imagine, they were not Jewish. They had no particular background in Judaism, 
Their background was, in fact, in idolatry. They were not monotheists. They had not seen the connection between the unity of God and ethics. All this had to be brought to them on the basis of the preaching they came to accept in the name of Christ. They had absorbed as much of Judaism as was necessary in order to understand and practice Christianity, but there had never been a thought in their minds that there would be any conversion to Judaism. At least, there had not been such a thought until it came to Paul's attention that some of them proposed to do exactly that. Paul is writing from a position in which he understands to be the apostle particularly to the Gentiles. And he has authorization from the church in Jerusalem to do precisely that, which means that Gentile families that decide to accept Christ are baptized in water, receive Holy Spirit as a result of that, and are then understood to be part of the church. At no moment have they converted to Judaism in that understanding. And the principal marker of this change was that the early Christian leadership on the whole, this was Paul himself, of course, Peter, and also James, the brother of Jesus, accepted that Baptism does not imply the practice of ritual circumcision of males. But might it imply something else? People in Galatia began to take up the practice of keeping some of the rules of kashrut, of dietary rules. They began to keep some of the observations of fasts and feasts in Judaism. This makes Paul furious. It's why he's writing. He believes that because of the background in idolatry, it is dangerous for these Celts to do anything but focus on Christ himself. And in order to make this argument, Paul takes the example of Abraham. Abraham because Abraham is understood to be the forefather of all Judaism, but he lived well before the time of Moses. And he was given the covenant before he accepted circumcision. That's all Paul needs in the passage that you can see for today in his letter to the Galatians. Brothers, I speak in human terms. By the way, I've retranslated this because he really doesn't say brothers and sisters. Yes, he's a sexist. We just have to live with it. It's the way he talked. I speak in human terms. Once a person's will has been ratified, no one annuls or adds to it. The promises were made to Abraham and to his seed. It does not say seeds as of many, but as of one seed, that is Christ. Now in Genesis 15, that Paul is here referring to, the promise is to Abraham and his seed that they will inherit the land. This is the covenant. The promise is given to him. It is stated at the close of the promise that Abraham believed in God. He had faith in God. And God reckoned that to him as righteousness. So his overall argument is going to be Abraham's righteousness was in the act of belief not in the performance of any duty that had been mandated by the law. And he makes that point emphatically in what follows. 
This I say, that the law which came 430 years later with Moses does not void a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance comes from the law, it no longer comes from the promise. But God granted it to Abraham through the promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. It was ordained through angels by a mediator, but a mediator is not one with the sender, although God is one. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Impossible. For if a law had been given that could make alive, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the scripture has consigned all things under sin, so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were consigned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our pedagogue, our guide, until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a pedagogue, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. As many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So what Paul sets out is a clear understanding that the law is something which can only apply in a differentiated fashion. It applied not at all to Abraham at the very beginning. Then it became a part of the covenant through Moses. But now with the arrival of faith, it is no longer binding in the same way. He does believe that there are going to be those who practice Judaism all around him. Keep in mind that in this particular period, there are many, many more practitioners of Judaism than there are of Christianity. Christianity, as he writes, is overall a subset of Judaism with only a few exceptional Gentiles. So that then takes us to the considerable change that's involved when Martin Luther applies these same principles, because he is no longer obviously writing for a church that is predominantly Judaic. Within 16th century Germany, there is a very vague understanding of what precisely Judaism is. There was an enormous conflict early in the 16th century over the question of whether Christian scholars should even read Hebrew thought that Hebrew might in some way corrupt their understanding of the scripture. And I have to say that Martin Luther, for all his considerable accomplishments, never succeeded in breaking through to an enlightened position on Judaism. But he's not writing to Jews in any case when he deals with his treatise, The Freedom of a Christian, in 1520. At that time, he is writing to Christians in Germany after his posting of the 95 Theses, which, as you all know, caused a spot of bother. <laughs> and part of his argument is in the treatise Freedom of a Christian to explain how it is that neither he nor anyone else should bend to the power of the law in his time.
But when he says law, he doesn't mean the Torah of Moses. When he says law, he means the authority of the church, which at that time was construed as con extending the law of Moses. The very meaning of law has changed, and the very target of the argument has changed. It is no longer people who might be inclined to adapt practices of Judaism. That's not the question at all for Luther, as it was for Paul. Instead, the issue is, should you continue listening to the edicts of the papacy as being binding on your behavior because they have divine sanction? And he says, you must stop doing that. It's not an argument to prevent that he's making. It's an argument to reverse an attitude towards the papacy within his time. It's very interesting, not so much in this treatise, but in others near this time, that he often makes the aside that he never understands why it is that the pope doesn't agree with him. Note to self, when you call someone's position the cauldron of evil, they're not likely going to <laughs> agree with you. Just saying as a mild rhetorical aside, you might just, just bear this in mind. Should you ask how it happens that faith alone justifies, that is, makes righteous as Abraham was made righteous, that faith alone justifies and offers us such a treasure of great benefits without works in view of the fact that so many works, ceremonies, and laws are prescribed in the scriptures. That they are, they are added to within ordinary Christian practice. I answer, first of all, remember what has been said, namely that faith alone without works, meaning works of law, justifies frees and slaves. We shall make this clear later on. Here we must point out that the entire scripture is divided into two parts, commandments and promises. Although the commandments teach things that are good, a proposition with which, by the way, one might very well disagree, you know, stoning oxen that run away doesn't strike me as being a particularly good solution and no more wise than stoning adulterers, but let's take his position at face value. Although the commandments teach things that are good, the things taught are not done as soon as they're taught. For the commandments show us what we ought to do, but do not give us the power to do it. They are intended to teach man to know himself, that through them he may recognize his inability to do good and may despair of his own inability. Commandments are there to teach limitations and the awareness of human weakness. This is the first power of faith. Let us now examine also the second. It is a further function of faith that it honors him whom it trusts with the most reverent and highest regard since it considers him truthful and trustworthy. And this leads him to the following proposition, which is quite a remarkable change in the definition of worship within the 16th century. The very highest worship of God is this, that we ascribe to him truthfulness, righteousness, and whatever else should be ascribed to the one who is trusted. This will emerge as a major principle of Protestant worship, namely that it is the intentionality of placing one's faith in God which is the act of worship itself. You probably thought it had something to do with going to church. Martin Luther doesn't understand it that way. He thinks 
what occurs when we are in the midst of such activities, as we conventionally call worship, is that faith which is the true and highest form of worship. Why are Protestant churches plain and Catholic churches fancy? You see the principle exactly here in his argument on Christian freedom. And then he comes to what he calls the third incomparable benefit of faith is that it unites the soul with Christ as a bride is united with her bridegroom. We're back to the marital imagery again. By this mystery, as the apostle teaches, and that's always Paul for Martin Luther, there's only one apostle who counts, Christ and the soul become one flesh. And if they are one flesh, and there is between them a true marriage, indeed the most perfect of all marriages since human marriages are but poor examples of this one true marriage. That's a remarkable aside, is it not? As fundamental in, his, in its own way as what he said about worship, just as true worship is attributing your confidence in God, so true marriage is your relationship with Christ in comparison with which all other relationships are relative. It follows, he says, that everything they have they hold in common, the good as well as the evil. What does he mean by that? Well, he came to know marriage, and he came to understand that when you get married, what you see is not what you get. <laughs> and what you see probably becomes more disappointing over time. And you, in fact, accept an enormous range of human experience with the person, which is sanctified by the relationship. If it's a good marriage, it metabolizes what is bad and copes with it, not as easily as with what is good, but it can nonetheless cope with it. That, he says, is also the relationship between the believer and Christ. They are so joined to one another that Christ can sanctify the believer with his sin, with his faults not only when the believer manages by some luck to do good. One feature of Luther's understanding of faith, which is frequently overlooked, is that it is deeply embedded in the mystical literature of the Middle Ages. He is concerned with this issue not only of contact between the human and the divine, but how it is that their relationship is transformative, that what is human is actually transmuted as a result of contact with God. Luther believes that's what occurs when a person believes in God. And that's why the act of belief is imputed to that person as righteousness just as it was in the case of Abraham. He understands very well that we know things now, in the 16th century, that we did not know in the time of Abraham, but he nonetheless believes that that principle of confidence and trust in the divine is the only form of true worship that there is, and is the only means by which a person can become righteous. Laws, he believes, constantly steer us wrong because the best they do is show us that we can't quite manage to keep them all. And very often, the very fact of a law, both he and Paul say, the very fact of a law will give you the idea to do something you hadn't thought of doing before. 
What do you do when you see the sign that says, keep off the grass? Or when you see the sign on Annandale Road that says, you're going too fast, slow down. I tell you, my accelerator gets depressed at exactly that moment. This is one of the ways in which human psychology works with law. And Luther is arguing that there has to be some principle, therefore, that transcends law by permitting us to be changed as a result of our contact with God. This is also why Luther characteristically refers to Christ as being the Word of God, to Christ as the Word of God. Yes, it is true we encounter Christ in the Bible, but the vibrant principle inside the Bible, the Word of God, is truly Christ. From Luther's perspective, it is not accurate to treat the whole Bible as if it were equally the Word of God. That's why he refers to the epistle of James as an epistle of straw. It's the opposite of his maiden epistle because James says that faith without works is dead. This is not right, according to Martin Luther. And as a result of that, the fact is that by using an understanding of Christ as the true word of God, Martin Luther was constantly in the process of reevaluating scripture according to the extent to which it showed the principle of faith as being both central and transformative. The last thing Martin Luther was, was a literal reader of the Bible because its authority from his point of view resided in his capacity to marry the soul to Christ, as he says, to make that introduction and not to be used in any other manner. We'll see that not every other reformer happened to agree with Martin Luther, but we will not be doing wrong if we gain an understanding of him to begin with which I hope we've done during this discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, please. I don't want the first question to be the cardinals for obvious reasons. Yes, please. We'll take the canter instead of the cardinal. This is an excellent question. What does Luther make of the fact, which we now know is a fact, that Jesus himself was a law-abiding Jew? Some would even say a rabbi. In fact, the New Testament calls Jesus rabbi in the Gospels more frequently than it uses any other title. So wouldn't you therefore clearly understand that Jesus' cultural location was in Judaism. As you rightly say yourself, Bob, one way to avoid this insight is to fasten on those passages where Jesus is in conflict with other teachers, typically the Pharisees, and then to read the conflict as if the argument means he's rejecting Judaism, when all he's rejecting is that counter-argument. And during this period, and indeed before this period, the term Pharisee itself was used in Christianity as if it meant someone who opposed Jesus on the basis of a so-called learned Judaism. 
Now, if you read all of the references to the Pharisees in the New Testament itself, you will find that, in fact, there were Pharisees who were sympathetic to Jesus. So, for example, at the time that Jesus was being hunted down by Herod Antipas, who wanted to kill him, the people that told him he should be on the run were Pharisees. You don't do that to someone who's your mortal enemy. After the resurrection, the book of Acts tells us that there were Pharisees who believed in Jesus. In fact, interestingly, it says this in the very same passage, this is Acts chapter 15, where the whole issue of circumcision is being discussed. Those same Pharisees who believed in Jesus thought, yes, anyone can be baptized, but then the covenant of circumcision must be kept if you're a follower of Jesus. Their position, and this position overall, is known as that of a group within Christianity that was called the Ebionites, the Evionim in Hebrew, which means the poor. The poor, because they lived in Jerusalem, they engaged so frequently in sacrifice that it impoverished them. And because they lived in Jerusalem, not as residents of Jerusalem, but as people coming in from Galilee and elsewhere, they had no trade to support themselves with. So they had to be supported by others. Incidentally, Paul supported them. Paul collected money from all of his Gentile churches to support the Christian Jews in Jerusalem who were sacrificing in the temple. Another indication that you could disagree profoundly and yet recognize the other as belonging to the movement overall. These believing Pharisees held that in the book of Genesis, the same Abraham who is said to be righteous is the Abraham who is commanded to keep circumcision. Yes, he does it two chapters later, in chapter 17. But there, circumcision is indicated as being the sign of the covenant. So, the believing Pharisees take the line that really we should accept the covenant as a whole. This group, as far as we can see, continued to exist and even to thrive in the eastern part of the Mediterranean until the time of the rise of Islam. Uh, we would be living in a very different kind of culture if the Ebionites still existed. So Martin Luther does not appear to have been terribly well aware of the Ebionites, though he could have been. Uh, their teaching is referred to in the work of the church father, Irenaeus, with whose many treatises Luther was familiar. Did he not read that part? Or did he read it in a hurried fashion? I'll have to ask him at a later point. I just don't understand uh, why there's not a clearer understanding of that within his own work. But Luther himself despite the fact that he tends to use the Pharisees as oppositional figures, he uses the word Jew to mean someone who rejects Christ and shouldn't. You know, someone who's been brought up to believe, but for some reason doesn't. Despite all that, he has to admit that Jesus was engaged in the practice of the ordinary Judaism of his time, and he does admit that. He copes with it by using the image I quoted from Paul's letter to the Galatians of the law being like a pedagogue. The pedagogue, the paedagogos in Greek, had a particular function. If you belong to a wealthy household and therefore thought your child should go to a school, should really learn with a scholar, should learn with a scholar of Greek, 
uh, should learn preferably from a scholar who was born in Greece. Even if you were in Rome, you was, this is what you wanted. This was your standard of education for a child, that from an early age, the child would know Greek and the literature involved. But to get the child from your house to the school, you used a pedagogue. And the pedagogos was also able to give some elementary lessons to the child. But the pedagogos fulfilled his or her function when the child was dropped off at the school. The law, the Torah, in Paul's understanding, and this is what Luther then picks up, the law should be understood simply as being a guide to the point where faith can occur. And once that faith has occurred, what then? Well, they actually have different views. Because Paul thinks, for all that he does not want Gentile Christians to start celebrating Hanukkah, let's face it, this is the kind of thing he doesn't want, as I have to remind my colleagues sometimes on various ecumenical commissions, they should take a look at Galatians before they run into this with completely innocent enthusiasm. In my opinion, all forms of enthusiasm should be well-informed, even if cynical, rather than think this is just good-hearted, therefore we should do it. He does oppose that kind of thing. But Paul also believes and he's right, that Judaism is not going to disappear because he happens to come to faith. He knows very well that Judaism will be practiced and he believes the majority of Jews are not going to convert to Christ. He works at it, but he understands what the demographics of his time are. And that's why he is not saying the law does not count for anybody. He is saying the Torah is applied in a differenti differentiated fashion. The law in, in Paul does not apply to everybody. Here's the difference. The law in Luther does not apply to anybody. Because he's, remember, he's changed the definition of law. Now it's not just Torah. It's the Torah used as a justification for papal power. And, of course, he understands that he's also dealing with a different condition of people on the ground, whom he's not simply warning away from two or three innovations that might be dangerous. These are people he's trying to say, we've made a cultural mistake in believing that in obeying these commandments from an authority, we are being righteous. It doesn't work. It is a complete failure. And that's one reason that he becomes strident. He believes that he is in a literally end time controversy, which will determine how his generation comes out within the judgment of God. It's why also he is, he is known for being, shall we say, a little bit earthy in some of his remarks. But there too, there's a kind of temperamental affinity between Paul and Luther. Paul in this same letter in Galatians, when he gets himself very upset, begins aggregating all these different possible ways of being influenced by Judaism. So he starts calling someone who wants to keep the calendar of Judaism a member of the circumcision party. He uses circumcision as a metonym for the use of all elements of the Torah by non-Jews. And then, he, having made that aggregation himself and having posited the metonym, he then gets all angry with it and says, I wish those who would circumcise you would castrate themselves. So, when you have that kind of precedent in scripture, and you're Martin Luther, with great skill in the German language, you can imagine the kind of rhetoric that he gets up to. He basically can easily become as crude as St. Paul. 
And for much the same reason. That is, you develop a position, you see a principle, but then you cast the opposition in the role of being completely against that. Maybe beyond what the facts warrant. And then you attack that as being, well, in Paul's case, the devil's dungeon, which I think is worse than telling the circumcisers to castrate themselves, actually. So part of the affinity of Paul and Luther, I think, is temperamental as well as intellectual. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. This is an excellent question, which I'll just repeat for the sake of the recording. Why should we understand the function of the law as pedagogue to operate until faith comes instead of until Christ comes? You know, isn't it more straightforward to make it Christ comes as in BC and AD? But Christ as the word of God is in fact not contained in time. Therefore, when Abraham believed, although Jesus had not been born yet, he believed in Christ. In the same way as when the world was created by means of the word of God, the word of God was Christ at the moment of creation, although Jesus had not been born. Martin Luther still holds to what by this time is an extremely well-established idea of Christianity, namely that Christ to be understood needs to be understood as being eternal. The particular instance of Jesus is the embodiment of the Word of God, the incarnation. That is obviously an important moment, the pivot of human experience, because it brings faith to its clearest articulation, but that doesn't mean that faith had not existed before. And for the same reason, Luther and, and other thinkers of his time thought it's conceivable that a person not connected with the culture that produced the Gospels could believe in God as Abraham did. Moses is used by Martin Luther in two senses. Sometimes uh, Luther refers to Moses simply as being the one who promulgated the law. And that's not an altogether good thing for reasons we can clearly see. On the other hand, he also understands Moses as a prophet. And any prophet is understood as being an example of someone who has believed in God. And in particular, who has articulated the Word of God because the Word of God is Christ, it means that the prophets were inspired by Christ. That's his conception, and I want to stress that part of his conception is not original. Not original. It easily goes back to the second century of the Common Era with the conception of Christ being the Word of God, being the inspiration of the prophets. Once you make the move of not concentrating on Jesus as historical, but on Christ as eternal, that is a natural, logical result. Doug, yes please, you were patient. <laughs> 
this is an excellent question. Do Paul and Martin Luther regard Christianity as a disruptor that displaces Judaism? Paul is the more complicated partner in this discussion. As I mentioned, he believes, as a realist, that Judaism in the Roman Empire is going to continue to thrive. It has been estimated that about 7% of the Roman Empire was Jewish at the time that Paul was writing. Of that 7%, a very tiny minority were also believers in Christ. And as a result of that, just four years after he wrote Galatians, when he wrote to the Romans, he devotes the central portion of the letter to the particular question, what has become of the election of Israel since a very large number of the children of Israel have not believed in Christ? And his answer to this question is that all Israel will be saved. And by all Israel, he means what we call practitioners of Judaism, as well as all practitioners of Christianity, both those who are Gentile and those who are Jews. In other words, he accepts that time is running out. An attempt to convert all Jews is not going to work, but the promises made to Abraham were the promises made to Abraham. Paul uses the same logic he deploys in Galatians, but now in Romans he uses it in a different way to say Israel will not be abandoned by God. The fact that there's a disagreement on the identity of Jesus does not, in fact, nullify the covenant. Martin Luther is a simpler and more disagreeable story uh, because he believes that the reformation of Christendom, as he prefers to think of it, he prefers to think of the whole of believing Christianity as being a unit of operation. Its reformation is going to bring about the emergence of true Christians, that is, those who operate by faith, not by convention. And that will bring about a final conversion or extermination of those who oppose. He clearly does imagine that, whether it is the Muslim powers who were at that time a genuine threat to Europe, right? 1529, they're going to besiege Vienna. Imagine that. Had they succeeded, Leon Botstein couldn't conduct there. <laughs> Europe very nearly ended at Vienna. So one of the sensibilities that Martin Luther brings to his writing is political as well as theological. And when it comes to dealing with those whom he conceives of as being enemies of the gospel, he is not sympathetic. I think this simply has to be acknowledged. There are those who try to save Luther from himself. Uh, I think in this regard, that cannot quite be done. Rosalie, I think you'll be the last question. Do I have permission to take another question? I do, okay. Rosalie suggests a simplification which comes directly from St. Paul. St. Paul, in order to give a kind of thumbnail sketch of his position, says the letter kills, the spirit gives life. By the way, you notice that like Martin Luther, therefore Paul is not a literal reader of scripture because the letter kills. Because if you make 
the letter of Scripture, your standard, it has become a law to you. It is the Spirit that gives life. But the only place I would disagree, and I think both Paul and Luther would, he doesn't see the Spirit as being the Spirit of the law. The Spirit is rather the Spirit of God through Christ. Well, that's the Christ concept. That's... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, and Paul and Luther would agree with you and would say one of those was Abraham. Yes, and then, but interestingly enough, I wanted to get this point too, that, that Paul was supposed to have had a mystical experience which would have made him a Christ figure in a way. Did Luther ever have those kinds of experiences? Oh yes, I think, I think that, that Luther can be described as being a practical mystic. Uh, and sometimes he brings to bear, we'll get to this somewhat next week, as we bring in Calvin and other figures with whom Luther winds up disagreeing. Martin Luther had a very lively spiritual contact with Satan in his prayer life. And what he does in order to deal with that brings out both the best and the worst in him. But I think I got the sign from the cardinal, so sometimes I obey cardinals, and for that reason we'll bring the discussion to a close here, and I hope to see you next week.